saying, uh, I'm going to share my work, and I'm going to also make an argument. I, so I've, I've been working for 15 years in between academia. I also have a company. I'm an artist. I do my own solo projects. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I believe is happening or what, what direction we might be heading with digital art. I'm going to make a pretty much... Um, I'm going to provide some, some experience that hopefully uh, can back this idea that I believe uh, the future of art relies mostly in two main technologies. One of them is augmented reality, which uh, a lot of my work is based on uh, in research. And another one, which is a more recent endeavor of mine, it's uh, artificial intelligence. I believe the merge of those two, these two technologies will uh, generate and create a lot uh, of what we call digital art for already today, but especially for the next years to come. But I want to also make a, I want to make an argument here that uh, and we cannot ever neglect the, our human condition. So we need to go back to literature, to math, and in particular to nature. So I'm going to argue that generative art, which by the way, it's the definition of uh, the digital art, which is usually by default uh, generative, it relies in algorithm design. It relies actually in a lot of things we learn from nature. So there is a direct correlation between these very sophisticated terms like AR, AI, with actually with nature, with, with our human condition, with our surroundings. And basically, I'm also going to argue that literature is actually becoming a nuclear element in what artists are doing at the moment, in particular with uh, artificial intelligence. So I'm going to start very qu uh, quick. I just want to introduce, uh, as it was already mentioned, I am from Porto. This is my hometown. I grew up uh, in the 80s. Uh, I was exposed to a lot of electronic music. In Europe at the time, Germany, Portugal, Spain, Italy, there was, it was the techno boom. And by the way, uh, Detroit, Chicago, these were a lot of these aesthetics, a lot of these elements come from. So the, it's interesting how I came to Michigan, and uh, it's actually there is a strong foundation in what I love, which is this, is to be immersed in uh, environments, music, people, there's something there. And this was a passion, an early passion of mine that uh, guided me to what, through my work, initially through music, and I didn't know at the time, but these lights, these lasers, being lost in that uh, environment, deeply affected me. And also another element, DJs were actually not just pressing play, they were actually manipulating the sound, sampling, scratching. So that was my introduction to what we call usual improvisation. We know all new musicians, we know how they work jazz musician, the skills involved in actually manipulating something in real time. So uh, this is, for example, a very quick uh, example, Jeff Mills early on how we control these electronics, how we manipulate them, deeply affect me to write my, at the time, my master thesis, trying to identify how can we go from there with music to actually do this in the bigger context, which is what we call usually live cinema, how we can perform cinematography experience in real time. That became what we usually call more gaming today, maybe, but there is a, a whole field of performance artists, audiovisual artists that really execute this today. And um, in order to do that, I pursue my, my endeavors with, with academia. Uh, and some of the projects I'm going to show quick, uh, very, very quickly next uh, are a product of what I do in school, in academia, but what I also do outside of academia. So I want to make also, I know at least there is a younger student here with us. I, I want to make sure that it's the, the message comes across that what we do and what we research, what we create, software, what we design in academia, does not necessarily have to end in a journal. It could, and I do that, but I also try to bring it to performance, to a more broader context, trying to bring people outside of academia, uh, arts, music, culture, uh, so it has a bigger impact. And also commercial. There's also some commercial application software. There's also uh, so, some uh, more commercial projects that are coming from that. So it's a whole spectrum that I live. And of course, the, this spectrum goes from design to uh, human-computer interactions, which is a very technical term that means basically how we program, how we understand technology, how we manipulate them. And there is, of course, media and heart theory. So I live kind of in the middle of this through performance. My work uh, and my research always been very practice-based. Uh, 
Uh, that means I design, I create uh, element software usually, then we test them. We test them, that's where HCI comes with, human computer interactions. And uh, finally, we bring this to public. We try to present this in the context that um, ca can be evaluated also as, a, as an artistic experience. Also, I just want to make a really quick uh, note here that I want to, I, I was blessed when I came to the United States 2010 to do my PhD to work with a choreographer because my field is interdisciplinary, right? I need to work with different people since uh, computer science, with, with art departments, with uh, uh, the theater, art and dance. So I was blessed to work with a choreographer that early on teach me something very valuable when we collaborate. Not just in academia, anywhere we work in any company, the, there is no, there is no hierarchy. Pretty much we work as a team. Communication is crucial and when we work we collaborate together. It's a, it's a, there is a level of respect. There, there is not necessarily a overall creative direction when we all coming in with our own ideas and projects and, I, and uh, ambitions and we put our hearts, we need to have a human connection and have an, a meaningful human experience. So I just wanna highlight that because that's what my, it became my supervisor called zero methodology. It has a lot to do uh, with this zero point methodology. It has a lot to do with this idea that we need to come with these solid foundations at a human level so we can bring more solid methodologies and empirical data into the experience. Also, I need to introduce this very simple concept that, uh, well, maybe not so simple, but I, it's difficult to talk about these things if we don't understand how can we go from the physical to the digital world. And it's a spectrum. So we have, we usually call this spectrum mixed reality. There is other terms. Uh, I personally focus in a small subset of this. This is called augmented reality. And what does it mean? Augmented reality, it means we're merging physical and digital, which is the different, for example, for those of you who do virtual reality, you're in the synthetic artificial world. Everything is digital. When, I, we're, in digi when we're working with uh, augmented reality, we overlay, overlay them. So for me, this is very powerful, not just at an artistic level, but also as a personal level. As how I feel, how I experience the world, I need to be grounded with the physical world. So that's why, for me, Augmented reality, which was the, the first element that I highlighted in this kind of, this my uh, equation to what the future of digital art is, is that we need to be grounded still in the physical world. So for that, the human body plays a huge role. And that's what my research started. I was very, in, very inspired by Marcel Cunningham. Probably some of you know, he is, is probably the most uh, influential choreographer, uh, designed some of the first computer, uh, computer software applied to dance. And uh, I was very inspired by this piece, Beeps. And when I start to work in this, I have no idea. Probably like a lot of you when they go to grad school, what am I doing? What, what is this? Uh, so my choreographer, my, my, my supervisor told me, let's, let's do a show. Let's do what, what this called, let's do an experience. You wanna work with real time. You wanna work uh, designing software. You wanna work with generative. And by the way, generative means it's like particles. We're generating things. Just like nature, we have animals, there's things that are being generated, created, it's alive. That differs a lot from what we usually call, uh, for example, bad media, probably some of you in media studies heard this term before, which is like video, uh, like this for example, I'm playing a video now, this is not real time, right? This is not real, I'm just playing a uh, play button. When I work with generative art or generative design, it's alive. It's an algorithm producing things. So what we did, we designed a very simple, uh, iPad uh, app that I control in real time, my 10 fingers, to collaborate with, uh, with, um, with dancers. So using this kind of holographic screen, I'm able to in real time with my fingers to manipulate these lines, almost like a, becomes like a element, like a shadow that I can play with them. So I spend months in a rehearsal with, uh, with the dancers, bringing this digital element to, to the piece not just a background, but it's actually an element of the dance. So it becomes a part of the choreography. And this was very valuable to me. I learned a lot from this experience with the three, four shows, and I learned valuable conclusions, which uh, some of the, the main conclusions I, I, I get, I was exhausted in the end of the show. I was like exhausted. And I, my, all my attention, all my brain, uh, all my capacity of focus was 
brought in into those 10 fingers manipulated in real time. And I wanted to go beyond, I want to be able to do more and better things. This was at the time this technology came along, the Kinect sensor. By the way, uh, it probably has been outpassed by now by ChatGPT, but at the time this was the most groundbreaking technology in terms of adoption. It was a very cheap sensor that came with the Xbox at the time, and people can actually do motion tracking in real time. So this was a game changer. With a $50 software now, and the SDK just came available online, as I was going out of this from this show and starting to think what I'm doing with my work and research, this technology became available. This technology can scan our body in real time and allow us to track our skeleton. So that gives me the ability now to to actually to start to think about uh, not necessarily what I'm doing with my fingers, but I can automate what my fingers now are doing, and the computer and the automation is actually running a lot of those tracking, the joint information in real time for me. So we designed a whole software for ballet dancers that we pretty much we, we record all the ballet positions. So we gave that data, the X, Y, Z from each joint of the body, and uh, it becomes like a, a mirror then, because then you can go in front of the camera, and the camera can tell you how to do a plie, how to do specific ballet positions. So we also did this open source. We put the software out there for free. We thought this could be valuable, for example, students who were not able to afford ballet lessons, and they, have, they might have an Xbox, or it, it, it becomes a way for them to improve or learn some ballet skills very efficiently, very easy. And again, this is a very low budget technology. So it, it really transformed. And of course, we publish it, uh, ACM. And the interesting thing about this, for those in academia know, when we publish, actually, and we provide the software, we provide the foundation for other people to actually to test it. So we have other universities and other departments to test our own software. Uh, successfully, at the time, there were some problems, especially uh, in ballet. The, the lower feet plays a huge role, and at the time, the tracking, the resolution, there were some problems there, but uh, this other research provoked, provided valuable insights how to, to, to create this uh, technical software. That became the foundation to our next show. And that is now, I can actually generate real-time environments, generative environments, and I don't have to be using my 10 fingers now. Now I can be operating buttons, controls. Now I, I'm like in a, operating my spaceship, which is my interface, to make decisions. Not necessarily just how X, if I'm going left and right, but I can do bigger decisions in, the, in, the, in what I'm doing in real time. So creatively, this was a big step up. And we start to perform this also outside of the universities. I start to collaborate with the a collective called Quixotic, and we started to perform these shows um, in the United States in multiple events. So that gives me a lot of things that are very important. For those who are in arts and music experience, being in a stage, perform. Uh, so that gives me the practice, practice-based. So we started to design and create works a lot based on this technology, augmented reality applied to the body. How can we bring these two elements together as one? It feels like the digital and the physical become one identity. And this is just a very quick glimpse. This is processed in real time. And I'm dancing, again, with visuals with the performer. And the performers, why do they like this? Because in the past, they had to memorize every single cue of a dance. Now, improvisation also becomes a, a possibility for them. So for them, this is very interesting. Choreography does not end in what the choreographer decides in all the cues. They have the option to be there in the moment and make decisions. For me, as an artist, that's essential. And I could feel in the, the students and the, 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 pro, the professional dancers we work with, they really appreciate this. Because now they also part participate in the creative process. And I also start to understand this technology, depth point, the depth cloud, this particular language that is pretty much doing a 3D scan, is in, artistically is very powerful. So I also did some projects and some installations, exhibitions, just focusing in this language. That again, came from a technical software, started in academia, that now uh, gave me almost like a medium of expression. Uh, but my goal was not necessarily just to create uh, landscapes with, with uh, beautiful visualizations. I wanted to connect the 3D body with the 3D objects, with the 3D world. So my research uh, became very much how can I touch my skeleton, my body, 
with uh, 3D environments. How can I make a direct correlation between how I move and the digital environments around me? So we designed this first piece that is called 3D Embodied, what was exactly that. We designed three layers, create like a, a depth, so three surfaces, and we give the possibility of uh, performers to be inside of these environments experimenting. There was like buttons, there, was, there were things they controlled with the body, almost like a computer game brought to real life. So this was very interesting to, to understand and how the audience perceived this mixed reality experience, what's digital, what's physical. It was, a, a, again, this has a lot to do with gaming in many ways, but not necessarily just gaming. This is also live performance. Because when you're, you're, you're doing a, a, when you're gamers, for example, they're not really engaged looking to an audience necessarily. And here we have live performance, live dance performance, engaging with a live audience. So the, as we move forward, as we start to, to think about this concept in terms of how can we map our body, our reality to a digital world, I also was very inspired by the work of Anthony McCall, for example. His work in the 70s with light design was very much to go uh, show how light is a very powerful source, just static light by itself. So I try, I introduced his work from the 70s, but I did it all now with real time in digital. So using just, instead of usually in the, what you guys saw so far, I was, I'm projecting to walls, I'm projecting to buildings, I'm projecting to things. Now I'm actually projecting to the human eye. I'm projecting directly at the audience eyes. So this is a different experience. We start to, to play a little bit with this concept using uh, haze, uh, using smoke, so it creates this layer. And that creates almost like a new medium of, of expression. Technically, this is projection mapping, by the way. We just don't think about it necessarily, but it is. If we point the light directly at our eyes, we can perceive depth, we can perceive the specific information. So there, this is a whole new alphabet in projection mapping that I try to identify. And ultimately, when we feel comfortable that we can control this, we design a show uh, with Eriko Iguchi here, a Japanese dancer, that will provide the body, the dance, all the elements in real time to connect all these lights to her, her body. So let me show you really quickly uh, some of these, some moments from the show. So you can, you can see there is like all this layer of depth with light and with her body, she can manipulate this, just like a living organism. It's a, it's a living architecture. So she's the, almost like a master controlling these environments and creating poetry and depth uh, based. And we were very inspired by Butoh. For those who don't know, Butoh is a, is a Japanese performance art. Um, inspired by some of that some of the, the, the poetry that we find in Butoh, we find interesting. And again, it creates a layer of light between the audience and the performer. So the light becomes the medium of expression. Okay, so moving on. Another thing I started to incorporate next is the brain. How can we move, how can we go beyond? How can we add more layers to this? Let's incorporate the brain using BCIs, brain computer interfaces, uh, and scanning the body of the performer. The performer here, is, his name is Iago Di Quay. He's, he's an expert, he was also doing a PhD in uh, focusing in live performance using BCI. So we actually scan his body in real time and we gave the BCI the ability to transform his digital body. So this is a, a more complex architecture. How can the brain actually play a role in real time in this digital avatar and how we perceive this? And the, the audience was experienced this 
again, always, I always goes back to overlaying the physical and the digital. So the audience can perceive this digital augmented avatar, but also with the physical body. And we kept doing a few other shows. Uh, you can see he's wearing a, a BCI. And uh, we really push uh, and try to understand um, what the, the technology here can help us to do. And I'm not going to lie, there is a lot of problems using BCIs and brain-computer interface for performance, mostly because the audience does not see it, does not understand it. There is no, if the audience can see the data being processed from the, the brain, uh, that could be a correlation. Our experience is that the, the, the audience does not see this data. It can become problematic because there is no dialogue between what the performer is doing with the brain and what's happening, ca ca cause and correlation. But it was a valuable experience and insight. So that was a part of my, my work and my journey. For example, here, what he's doing with his hand is showing us, he's actually controlling this directly with the, with the brain. The hand is kind of to show us what he's doing, but the, the goal here, how much can we control, not just to start tracking the body, but actually going directly to the brain, and how can we merge this? So this is how I finished my, my PhD, and the, this was 2016. So this, again, software developed, uh, there was a whole body of work, research published, and it, it, a lot of performance as well, a lot of shows. So this was a full spectrum experience, and after that I decided to focus in generative art. And I opened a creative agency, it's called Atagrama, and um, we focus in doing live visualizations. We very much passion what is generative art. And I already talked a little bit about generative art. Generative art has to do with nature, algorithms that we find in nature. And a lot of the shows, a lot of the performance we do are exactly around these very simple ideas, to generate these elements live, transform them, manipulate them. This is the team, it's five of us. Uh, we work together, it's an international team. Some of us are here in US, different states. Some of us uh, are in Europe. And uh, the, the roots of it all comes from this. The, this idea that we can, uh, we can manipulate physical phenomena digitally. For example, this is a re reaction diffusion model. And it pretty much describes the emergence of periodic patterns such as spots, stripes, maze, and you can see it in the surface is animals, for example. If you feel it, pay attention in fish, for example, the patterns, you can find this uh, physics, this, this phenomenon. This is my, our mathematical models that we use in our work. And this is a huge inspiration for, for, for us. Basically, the understanding and following the rules of nature, almost like bringing this chaotic element to our work and trying to manipulate it, there's something very powerful that. In opposition, again, it's just playing a video, just playing something that I did that I find it's beautiful. No, I love this element. I'm playing something that has a life of its own, and I'm trying to manipulate. So after that, we did this uh, performance using this very simple algorithm that I just showed you, reaction diffusion. You can see how it's growing. And we have a performance in the middle with the using, again, this gauze, this holographic gauze. And the performer is uh, manipulating this algorithm in real time with her body doing pole dancing, which is probably not the most common art form you'll see in a show like this, but that's why we bought it. We, like, we thought it will be interesting to bring this art form that not, not always get the best recognition to a more high level visual, audiovisual experience. So we designed this show all using this algorithm uh, and allowing the performer, uh, Brin, the aerial dancer, to play with his algorithms in real time. This goes back a lot, again, to nature. It goes back, th this, the fact how is these things flowing, merging, uh, reacting, this is different than how we usually understand video. This is what it is generative art. It's, uh, it has to do with real time. It has to do, and you can see her body, by the way. Their body is being scanned. We have three uh, motion capture devices that connect camera, I show you guys, that is merging with this, with this reaction in real time. So basically, uh, we started also in uh, Datagrama, we were also very passionate about something that's called psychedelic art, which again, goes back to nature, very much so. So we also started to design and make content, for example, this one, completely generated in real time, uh, that brings and represents some of the landscapes using the same algorithm, reaction diffusion, 
but bringing landscapes that usually belong to more sacred, more nature-based experience. I don't know if you guys heard, for example, ego death. This is a representation of the, the process we usually call ego death that has to do with the idea of ego dissolution. And um, it's very technical, but it's also trying to bring and trying to make poetry, visual poetry, from these real-time experiences. The interesting thing is when we generate these elements, we generate them real-time as a band as a music band. And this is, you probably know bands, music bands. Now with how technology changed and is changing with visual arts and live visualizations, we work together just like a band does. And this is pretty much, when we do shows, this is pretty much what we have in front of us. It's a little bit overwhelming, but it's our tools. Just used to be guitars, used to be drums. It's kind of similar in many ways. These are our own instruments. And, um, just going to give you, for example, we, we usually, when we perform, uh, sometimes we collaborate, for example, with musicians, and we use audio. We, we, because it gen everything we generate is in real time, it's alive. So I can scan bodies, I can scan temperatures, I can scan Twitter data, I can scan anything I want. When we work with live music, for example, as in this case, we scan frequencies, use the bass. We have a camera in, th in the going in the 360 world, and going with the sound, representing the bass, which I believe it's the heart of the music. So as you can see, this, this synchronicity has to be done in real time. This has to do with being there in the moment with the music, with the audience reacting. That's the power of live performance. And of course, we also do, I'm sure you all seen projection mapping, breaking buildings, destroying. We, did, we do a lot of that, we did a lot of that, which is great. Uh, augmented reality, projection mapping. We also do more ambitious projects. For example, we go to big tents, we bring these big projectors and we try to completely change the environment, uh, recreate new, different experience that the audience is not expecting. For example, this very uh, short video I'm gonna present is, shows how the audience appreciates this kind of work these days, how younger generations value. And by the way, when I was their age, when I was doing this very early on, there was no recognition. It was just a background on a wall, on a club. No one really paying attention. That's changing very much. And just show, this is a show we did, I think 2019. Just li try to listen a little bit how the audience reacts. When they, no one knew, we completely covered the, the, the ceiling of a huge tent. No one knew there was going to be live projections. And we completely covered the whole ceiling. The sound is not very loud, but people screaming and appreciating because we're completely transforming. And you can see again, generative elements we go find in nature. The way it grows, it's a reaction. I, it's, I, I don't know if you can hear it, but there is a big appreciation. There, there is a, we feel that resonance, and that goes back to us, what we're we doing. To feel the energy, to feel the, the audience means a lot if you're performing. But I want to quickly change here. Uh, just, we just don't work with building stages. We also work a lot with nature. I'm very passionate about projecting unconventional surface. For example, uh, projecting elements, faces, uh, make them an actually interactive in real time so people can control them in real time. For example, this is in Austin, South by Southwest, projecting faces, elements, people can manipulate them, but also bring them into more complex uh, landscapes. Again, augmented reality. How can we, this? this is just one projector. How can we generate this kind of reality with one projector? This was in Florida, uh, and this was actually in Chicago, Lollapalooza a few years ago in a, one of the, the stages in Lollapalooza. We were commissioned to do the whole environment around the, the, the stage. And this really, this, this is just a quick video showing how we, the pictures sh shows a part of the story, but if you're there, there's like elements, details moving, subtle, it's like sculpture meets uh, light design. It's an opportunity to bring design envir uh, immersive environments but also to play with illusions with depth, to bring new, new elements. And again, you can see, for example, this 
elements here are physical elements, but you can see the lights here. The lights are matching, so we like to always, physical and digital, play with these illusions. And we also do installations that we go much further in terms of not just video lights, uh, but I want to, yeah, and we do it interactive. We always make trying to point things, for example, pointing at the moon. Why not? Proje projection mapping at the moon. Again, nature. Uh, we also start to incorporate, for example, lasers, trying to bring characters playing daytime, for example, augmented reality during daytime for our own eyes. And by the way, the biggest difference with augmented reality and uh, uh, with projection mapping is there a kind of, when we do it, uh, augmented reality in the phone, I can only see it, my, uh, I can only have that experience in the phone. When we do these things for big groups of people, everyone has the same experience. So it's a way to bring augmented reality to a group of people. And uh, of course, we, only, we, we also expand these concepts and we did shows during COVID and during the lockdowns that we, we tried, we, we incorporate this concept next because now we're only working for the lens instead of the human eye. So we're starting to design environments that are actually completely digital. Now we can do everything becomes an illusion. And including, for example, during the day, we can completely transform these kinds of illusions during the day, the kind of augmentations you'll see, uh, but also for those who are watching online during the day. And this takes me to my last, last, very last topic, uh, which is artificial intelligence. How can I bring artificial intelligence to this? And for those who are not familiar, artificial intelligence, the way it's introduced is pretty much creating databases and uh, information that can very, make very important, very uh, de decisive decisions, what's the best outcome. It's, very, it's used, for example, for cancer treatment, very important decisions, very important outcome. As a visual artist, I saw early on the powerful for this also to create content, not just necessarily to, to, to provide some kind of, um, of a outcome, numerical outcome, but actually to provide me visual representation of things. And this is what Deep Dream, for those of you who heard this probably before, this was developed initially by Google, uh, we're starting to incorporate. This allows us to use one seed, one image, and we can start to travel in this image. For example, here, uh, using a landscape from a, uh, a museum, we can literally travel inside of here. Here, using landscape from nature, giving it information from uh, elements that live within that landscape, we can travel inside of them. So this is a different strategy to make content. Here, for example, going back to the history, almost like archaeology, going through, traveling through different architecture, civilization, the Mayan culture, uh, going from, and by the way, this is completely unpredictable. That's the beautiful part of it. The computer is actually playing the creative role. So trying to, yeah, we're going from the Mayan culture to the, I don't know, the universe, something like that. But this is, for me, this is fascinating because this is when the, it's creativity, you're working with the computer. It's not just giving orders to the computer. Now, suddenly, the computer is like interacting with you, uh, giving you an expected outcome. So we're starting to, man to use this technology a little bit more intentional and starting to collaborate. For example, this was a, the first image with an with a illustrator. And uh, we, we cr created a series of works that we travel inside of their work. So it's very interesting for them as well to how the AI can understand their work and literally navigate into these landscapes. So we did a, a wide range of work, especially a lot tr trying to work with the psychedelic artists. From one image, how can we generate uh, content from them? For example, uh, Peru, Peru artists, we collaborated. How can we bring his art expression into image, into, into video art? Again, all generative. So th this was very transformative, how we can completely change uh, what we know as a traditional image just by seeding and doing libraries of data, reference and how we can create original artwork. This is one of the main animations we did uh, at the time. This was to celebrate the famous discovery of the LSD, and we were commissioned to do this piece. And um, it's trying to explain the, the famous bike ride. So this gave us the tools, working with a specific curated number of artists, to create these aesthetics and going back to the very foundation of something uh, that has an iconic history, how to, ex ex how to bring this history within these aesthetics. And for those of you who have a little bit of interest in these techniques, for example, this is the original animation, the 3D. This is 
uh, using the style reference, the, and this is kind of the, 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 output, the output. So this completely changes how the creative process is done. And this is also uh, the technique we're starting to incorporate more to do uh, more commission work. For example, here, a video clip uh, that we sketch, we collaborated with, uh, for example, this was Theo Scott, Paul Cricket, and Laura commissioned this video clip that it was sketched, 3D uh, render, and then we give it this final layer, these details, all these rich elements that we couldn't do before. And this was the time, a few years ago, that this came out. I'm sure you, all of you heard of DALI. This is groundbreaking, it's life-changing. And this just, and by the way, this project that I show you was before DALI came out. So now we have DALI, this was 2002, and just to, for those who don't know, Machine learning algorithms could already label objects in images, and now they learn to put those labels into natural language descriptions. And it made one group of researchers curious. What if you flipped that process around? We could do image to text. Why not try rendering text to image as well and see how it works? It was a more difficult task. They didn't want to retrieve existing images the way Google Search does. They wanted to generate entirely novel scenes that didn't happen in the real world. So they asked their computer model for something that it would have never seen before. Like all the school buses you've seen are yellow. But if you write the red or green school bus, it would have actually tried to generate something green. And it did that. OK. It changed everything, right? I think, I think it's fair to say that. Now I can go online. I can write Farve egg muck muffin, and I can get uh, different, uh, different prompts different outcomes. And it's not one particular style. It goes from illustration, specific, different arts, different inspirations. You can actually make it and customize it very much from what you want to generate. So this has completely changed the landscape, what we think about digital art and to make content, how we produce visual artifacts. So this is just different examples how we can generate different image. And this creates a huge discussion, which I don't have the time to address here. I'm just going to say it. Uh, that I believe this is very similar what happened with photography. And probably a lot of us read here Walter Benjamin, uh, the famous the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. I will argue this is a very equivalent phenomenon we're, we're, we're witnessing right now. I don't think this is the end of art at all. As a creator, I'm excited. Uh, I use it. I use it often. I didn't show very practical examples how we use it right now. We use it to prototype ideas. For example, we're designing things and we use it in the past, we had to do weeks of development modeling. Now, within a few seconds, I have a spark of an idea. I, I can have a visual representation of that. And I'm going to leave here uh, with a quote by Terence McKenna. That is, the world is made of words. This idea that the word is powerful, what we say is very powerful. And um, the new engineer that we're witnessing now is the prompt engineer in digital arts. And it's here to stay. It's not going away. And we all heard this sentence. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This is a powerful quote. Probably a lot of you heard it from the Bible. And uh, it's interesting how suddenly we're going back to the very, very own foundation of uh, literature, mathematics, and uh, ultimately, which is Interesting, because in the past, we we're so attached to technical 3D software, it's all the software. Suddenly, all that noise kind of fades out, and we're starting to think maybe reading, maybe humanities, maybe mathematical, uh, plays a much bigger role in how we perceive, we feel the world. So I'm going to end here with uh, my personal uh, conclusion, that is this future of art, of course, augmented reality, the, uh, artificial intelligence, but ultimately, there is, it needs to be a direct connection between creativity, biology, nature. I don't think we can separate our human condition, our human ability to feel, think, uh, and imagine to generate something that is meaningful to other people. So I'm going to leave it here. This is my website, both of them. I want to thank you so much, Chris, and everyone here for allowing me to, to, to be here and share my work. I know it was fast, but I wanted to share a lot of elements, there was a lot of layers. So feel free to, to make questions, and thank you so much. Yeah.